Hi, and welcome everyone to this Advanced Energy Industries webinar. My name is Rich, and I'm a senior manager with IEEE Global Spec. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's presenters. The first part of today's webinar will be given by Mark Ritzheimer. Mark is the product manager for thermal instrumentation at Advanced Energy. Mark specializes in new and emerging applications requiring precise temperature and materials control. Now, for over 10 years at AE, Mark has focused on all aspects of pyrometry and temperature measurement for advanced thin film and industrial applications. Previously, Mark worked at the FEI company in the area of ion and electron beam microscopy systems for semiconductor applications, specializing in defect analysis on advanced semiconductor devices. The second part of today's webinar will be presented by Dirk Fulboom. Dirk is the product manager for Precision Power Products Group at AE. He performs international business development, project management, along with technical and sales support for advanced energy SCR power controller products. He received his master's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Hanover in Germany and performed advanced coursework at the Technical University of Dresden. Gentlemen, welcome to today's event. And with that, I'll pass things along to our first presenter, Mark Ritzheimer. Mark, go right ahead. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. Uh, as already indicated, this webinar actually has two pieces. Uh, the first is going to be talking about pyrometers with me. This is Mark. And then about the second half of the presentation, or the second half of the webinar, rather, we're going to transition to Dirk, who will talk about SCR power controllers. So as we begin our presentation, but maybe before we get into more detail on each of the products, whether around the SCR power controllers or the pyrometers, I thought we'd take a few minutes at the beginning here and just briefly talk about why have these two products combined into the same presentation to begin with. And the answer is actually pretty simple, and that is that they're very complementary products to each other, and when combined, work very well together in a closed-loop solution for temperature control. The SCRs deliver precise power control for whatever is being heated, and the pyrometers precisely measure that, and that could be part of the furnace, an oven, or even measuring the temperature of the work product itself. If you take these two products and then combine them with a separate PLC or temperature controller, you would actually be able to build a closed-loop solution for temperature-controlled processes, basically working in real time. This has all kinds of benefits. This can improve process and product performance. It can actually help save energy. It can also improve the yield and generally creates an overall better processes, especially for the types of products where temperature control must be precise and absolutely understood and controlled every time. Okay, so now we'll turn our attention to pyrometers and talk about basically what is a pyrometer and how does it work. So in its simplest form, you could say almost a textbook definition here, a pyrometer is a non-contact optical temperature measurement device. And basically what it does is it measures the infrared thermal radiation coming off of an object. Uh, and as an example here, when something gets really hot, like you can imagine like a, 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 the burner in your kitchen on an electric stove, if you turn it on to high, you can actually see that filament glowing red. What you're actually seeing at those particular temperatures, you're seeing that thermal radiation coming off of that burner. It just so happens that at that particular temperature, your eye can actually see that. But for every object out there, there's actually this uh, same thermal information coming off of an object. You just can't always see it. And so a pyrometer, though, is intended to be able to see those temperatures from a variety of objects and from a variety of temperatures. You could say kind of low temperatures to also very high temperatures where it's noticeably hot, where even the human eye can actually pick that up. And it does that in a couple of ways. Um, and sitting inside every pyrometer, for the most part, is a wavelength-specific filter. And what that means is that within the pyrometer, sitting inside there is a detector, and it's seeing everything. It's seeing all kinds of energy and light being brought into that system. So what you actually want to do first and foremost is you want to control the information getting into it. And the way we do that is by choosing a certain wavelength filter. And we would do that by uh, based mostly on the material that we're be measuring. Uh, different materials typically have different wavelengths that you want to measure at, just kind of the physical property of the material itself. So we put that filter inside there. What it does is it blocks all unwanted information. So you can imagine if you're sitting in an open environment in a production area, you want to measure the object itself that you're heating. You don't want to measure the surrounding walls or any uh, overhead lighting or uh, 
um, any you know kind of unwanted information in there. So that's the first thing. The other thing to keep in mind is that it's usually always pre-selected. So when you talk about ordering a pyrometer or setting up a pyrometer, one thing you have to talk about at the you know at the beginning is what are you actually going to be measuring? So that's going to be the first question you're going to be asked. Are you measuring steel? Are you measuring glass? Are you measuring plastic, a powder, a liquid? These basic things. And what we're actually doing is we're actually helping you then choose the right pyrometer based on the right wavelength. Okay, so having said all that, then inside the pyrometer, as it gets this photo current, it's actually calculating the temperature based on the amplitude of that photo current, and it does that according to a calibration that it got in the factory before it would be shipped out to, to your site. And overall, this is a highly, highly accurate means of, of measurement. Um, instead of using something like, like a, a thermocouple where you're taking a physical contact method, and with some workpieces, this is just not possible. So with the pyrometer, you're actually able to get from the object itself, whatever that is, whether that's a heater surface, um, a heater itself sometimes, or certainly the work product, you're able to actually measure directly the temperature that's coming off that object. So let's talk about the different types of pyrometers that you might see out there. In, in two broad categories then, pyrometers can either be a fully integrated system where everything is fully integrated into a, a single unit, uh, where you have the optics, um, any collection lens, the, de the, de uh, the detector, the electronics, everything is all sitting together inside a single unit. Um, to kind of put this in a little bit of form factor, these are typically cylindrical. Um, and they could be as small as the size of maybe a, a D-sized battery or up to even like a, around the size of a can of Coke or a can of soda. But they're typically cylindrical. Um, everything is self-contained. They're robust. They're built for tough environments. And for every measurement you have, then you would actually have one pyrometer pointed at whatever you're trying to measure. The example then on below, uh, below is a little bit different. Um, instead of having everything combined into a single unit, what we actually do is we divide them into several different components. You can actually see that in a few components on the slide. So on the far left, there is an optical sensor. Um, this is again going to be a lens device. Um, typically these are on the order of like maybe a, a, a battery. So it could be like the size of a, of a AA battery, size of a, a size D battery. And sitting in there is a lens and some apertures, and basically all we're doing is we're collecting the thermal information coming off of the object. We're then routing it back through a fiber optic cable, and this cable could be several meters long. And then we're routing it back to a control unit. And then sitting inside that control unit are all the detector and electronics that we've, that we've already talked about. So for uh, every measurement point that you have, and sitting inside this detector, you would have a wavelength filter sitting there and a separate detector. That fiber optic cable is then connected into there, and that's where basically the brain of the system lives. An advantage of that sensor type measurement as indicated below are, are really, there are really two things. First, that little optical sensor that you would place next to or in proximity to whatever you're measuring is extremely small, and that's beneficial because it's just easy to integrate, has a small footprint, but also there are no electronics in there, so it's fairly immune to temperature or any type of RF or anything else that you actually have going on close to your operating environment. The other advantage is that you can have multiple channels in a system like this. So on the screen, I've only shown one right now, but it would be possible to actually have multiple sensors up to four potentially connected to a system like that. So you can imagine if you're trying to actually outfit an entire chamber or a process, then you could have up to four measurements coming back to the single unit, kind of one brain talking to each of those little different sensors, and it makes for an easier installation. So as we kind of talk more about a pyrometer, I'd like to spend a little bit of time on the theory of a pyrometer and kind of how it works. And I'll, I'll say up front that we probably don't have time today in the scope of this webinar to go into a lot of detail. But I at least want to leave you with a few key words that you might hear over and over again as you talk about pyrometers and even as you're selecting a wavelength, you will hear comparison back to a black body, emissivity, and Planck's equation. And I at least want to kind of show you what those are. So let's start with a black body. Uh, a black body is actually a theoretical object that, to be fair, does not exist. 
It's something that we don't actually see in nature itself. But if such a thing were to exist, we know that you could say it would be the perfect black. It would essentially absorb all energy around it and nothing would be reflected off of its surface. Um, what this actually means in practical terms is you couldn't see it because there wouldn't be any information coming off of that black body that we could actually see with our eyes. But keep that in mind that there's this concept that this exists. And even though it doesn't exist, a lot of the math inside a pyrometer and how we calculate photocurrent based at temperature and a particular wavelength all owe its origins to this concept of a, of a black body. So having said that then, connected to black bodies, there's a very important equation called Planck's equation. And it's a mathematical equation that basically says, okay, so we understand that there is no such thing as a black body, but I can clearly see that whatever I'm heating, it emits thermal information. I know that it emits infrared energy and infrared radiation coming off of that object. So basically Planck's equation is a way of comparing what we're actually seeing in real life, we compare it black, back to that black body, that ideal condition, and when, what we're actually able to do from that is calculate the temperature of the photocurrent that we're actually seeing. So again, this is probably beyond the scope of what we really have time for today. This is something that, to be fair, you never really have to worry, worry about on a, on a daily basis as you're using a pyrometer. But I think it's important to keep in mind, because as we talk about changes in emissivity, which we'll talk about a little bit later, what we're actually doing is potentially changing this equation. And so sitting inside here, this is sometimes the math that we're worrying about, and these are some of the things that we're trying to overcome. Just a quick example here, like, I, like I've talked about a couple of times now, sitting inside a pyrometer, there is a wavelength specific filter. In this case, uh, that filter we have is, let's say, at around three microns, as indicated at the bottom. It's that blue line that runs from three microns uh, kind of up the, up the graph. And what that actually means is if we had a pyrometer at three microns, the four different lines there, the red, the green, the pink and the blue all would correspond to different photocurrents that we see within that three micron filter and at those different photocurrents then we're able to convert those into temperature. Equally important, this is why I mention it right now, is that all the other information lower than three microns and higher than three microns, all that other information out there we're actually omitting from our measurement. So we're making sure that basically we're really zeroed in only on that three micron range. Okay, now that we've talked a little bit about how a pyrometer works and some of the theory behind its operation, let's talk a little bit about what it actually takes to make a good measurement. And first and foremost, it all, it all starts with choosing the right wavelength. Um, as we talked about, different properties respond differently at different wavelengths. Plastic is going to be different than glass, then will be different than steel. So the first and most important thing is basically make sure you've chosen the right wavelength. There are lots of different ways to do this. There's lots of information that it's easily searchable and lots of material property tables that can even help you define what that wavelength should be. If given a choice, and sometimes you will be, uh, we typically recommend to always choose the shortest of those wavelengths wherever possible if it gives you the right temperature range. A reason to do this is it will minimize any possible problems or effects of changing emissivity, which we'll also talk a little bit more in detail in this presentation. But as a general rule, always go shorter if possible to help minimize these, these problems. So beyond the pyrometer itself, then, something else we should always be talking about is the measurement environment itself. And the measurement environment could literally be where the pyrometer is placed. Something you have to keep in mind is even if you've chosen a wavelength filter inside that pyrometer, there's still a lot of thermal information getting into that pyrometer, and you want to help the pyrometer as much as you can by shielding or filtering out all the, uh, all the unwanted energy in there. Um, simple way to do this is actually just with physical blocking. Sometimes you might want to put a pyrometer um, with a shield or inside a tube or something such as this to help shield it from unwanted thermal radiation coming from a furnace or some kind of background. Advanced pyrometers also will offer you the ability to do uh, some background subtraction. So it's a way of trying to teach the pyrometer that all that energy it sees in the background is not part of the measurement and there are ways you can try to subtract that out. Doesn't always work, but it's definitely a good thing to try. 
And third, one of the most critical things, and we'll talk more detail about this here shortly, is managing effects from emissivity. There are two ways to do this. Um, choice of a two color, or sometimes known as a ratio pyrometer, where you actually measure not with a single wavelength, but two wavelengths. And then the other option is using an advanced pyrometer that employs active emissivity compensation, which we'll actually talk more about today. Just a quick glimpse at the wavelengths that you might want to measure at. Um, this is certainly not exhaustive, but this just kind of gives you a basic kind of overview of, in this case, what are near IR to mid IR, and a couple of things kind of pop out. Um, a lot of core industrial materials, uh, such as steel, non-ferrous metals, graphite, silicon carbide, ceramics, um, many heater surfaces, just given the nature of the material, they can pretty well be measured in this kind of near IR 700 nanometers to 1500 nanometer range. Uh, mid IR pyrometers, um, which are in the 2.3 up to around 5, are ideal for dip different types of um, coatings on glass or even bare glass itself. And lastly, as indicated on the bottom right there, then plastics typically are going to be longer wavelength from 8 to 14. And as we're talking today and kind of going through these different pyrometer options, we're really focusing on this near IR and mid IR type pyrometer, but certainly just be aware that other pyrometers are also out there as well. So I've mentioned a couple of different places here, emissivity. And this is another area where we have to take a pause for a second and talk about emissivity and, and kind of what is it. So essentially, emissivity is a physical property of the material being measured. And it's based on the object's reflectance. And it's basically a way of saying uh, how effectively, I guess in a sense, is that object heating and how effectively are we going to be able to to measure using a, a pyrometer. Emissivity is actually expressed as a correction factor, uh, typically on a scale of 0 to 1, um, and it helps us inside the pyrometer scale or correct the measured temperature for this emissivity property of the material. Every single wavelength pyrometer out there has an input for the emissivity to help provide an accurate measurement. And you have to typically enter that emissivity during installation. Uh, it's, uh, again, kind of based on some empirically dated or empirically gathered standards. You can do a search and you can search for different types of, um, of emissorials, of emissivities based on the material. Typically, as a general rule here, um, something that has a very low emissivity, so, you know, um, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 are going to be very, very shiny reflective surfaces like a polished aluminum or a gold or something like this. And on the opposite side, then something that has a very high emissivity, uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 is going to be something that's really black. Um, you can think of something that's uh, kind of a silicon carbide or something that has a heavy carbon content, uh, basically not very reflective. That's going to be a high emissivity object. And two different things that are required, um, even as you set up that pyrometer with the emissivity, you kind of have to keep in mind two things. The first is that you have to actually know what the, emissi what the emissivity is to, to start with uh, at the beginning of the measurement, um, at the beginning of the process, whatever that is. So you have to know something about it. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's not good enough just to guess. Uh, that correction factor is actually pretty important. And another critical part of this is that the emissivity does not change during processing. Um, you can imagine as you have a work product and you're depositing something on it, if you can visually see a change, if you can visually see it go from a shiny surface to a rough surface or vice versa, um, you're essentially changing the emissivity properties of that material. And almost guaranteed, if you're measuring with a pyrometer, you're also changing the accuracy of that pyrometer throughout that, that measurement. I'm going to go back to Planck's equation real quickly here, just to show that when we're talking about emissivity, it actually goes back to this same equation. Um, you might notice from the earlier slide, what we're actually doing is we're solving for a different variable. But this is why emissivity matters. It's all part of the same math that exists within the pyrometer that we need to worry and control for. So getting back to the measurement itself, let's talk a little bit about what happens if the emissivity is either unknown or potentially changes during the processing itself. 
And I think the basic question to start here with is, in either of these cases, can this actually add air into the measurement? And the short answer is yes, definitely. Uh, and something to be aware of is that the size and the scale of that air is actually based on the wavelength that you're working at in combination with the temperature range. So as you're choosing that pyrometer up front, that's definitely a consideration in choosing accordingly, uh, you know, choosing the wavelength that may minimize problems from emissivity down the line is definitely a way up front to manage that and try to minimize any problems here. But let's say you've done everything you can, you've chosen the right pyrometer, uh, you've chosen uh, the wavelength accordingly, you've gone into the literature and you can find references for the emissivity. So let's say you start your measurement and it seems to be working pretty well, but what happens if something changes during the processing such that the emissivity is affected? Uh, potentially there's oxidation occurring to the work to the workpiece, um, maybe you're depositing a certain kind of coating. I think a general rule of thumb here is that if, if you can see a visual difference, either in the shininess of, of the material or the roughness of the, or a color or a change in the hue of a color um, from the start of the process to the end of the process, then you've definitely affected the emissivity and potentially also affected the temperature reading as well. So. For processing then, and if the change in emissivity is occurring during um, this phase, there are two ways to potentially manage and, and kind of minimize as much as possible changes in emissivity. The first is using what's called a two-color ratio pyrometer. And this is the type of pyrometer where instead of having a single wavelength inside, it actually has two on board. And the temperature that you actually get from the pyrometer is based on the ratio of those two wavelengths. But there's something really important to keep in mind with this kind of pyrometer, and that is that there's an assumption built into this where as the emissivity changes, both of those wavelengths that are sitting inside the pyrometer that you've selected, the both wavelengths are essentially being affected by that change in emissivity in, in about the same amount. Um, if one if, if one wavelength rather is being affected more than the other, then this can actually lead to very large errors in your temperature measurement. In some ways, you'd be better off even just using a single wavelength at that point. So that's definitely something to be aware of. Um, another solution, and one I'll talk more about here today, is use of a pyrometer that includes active emissivity compensation measurement. And what this means is that this pyrometer can actually measure in real time the change in emissivity and then can correct the temperature accordingly. And this is that system that would have active emissivity compensation. So at first glance, the picture is going to look a little familiar to the slide we had earlier in the presentation where it's a remote type system. So you have your small optical sensor on the left that's collecting the thermal target radiated energy. That energy is routed back to the control unit uh, by that bright green fiber optic cable, and then it goes back to the control unit where we're actually making the measurement. And in this type of system, it's a special kind of hybrid system that actually includes an emissometer or a reflectometer. So instead of measuring just temperature, what we're actually able to do is measure the change in reflectance from an object and then calculate its change in emissivity. And the way we do that is by employing a source. So sitting inside that control unit, we have a an LED or even could be a laser source at a special wavelength that matches the wavelength of our temperature measurement and we fire a pulse of energy on the order of about a third of a second is this entire cycle but we fire a pulse of energy through that fiber optic cable to the sample surface and then we wait momentarily for the return and the difference of that outbound pulse versus the return pulse can tell us that the reflectance of the material is changing. That allows us to calculate the emissivity change, and then we're actually able to calculate in real time and make changes to the temperature in real time and, and always provide a temperature that's, that's accurate. Um, if you recall back from an earlier slide, I talked about single wavelength pyrometers use a fixed emissivity. So you put that emissivity in at the beginning, and regardless of your process or if the material is changing, you're kind of stuck with that emissivity. With an active compensation system, you're actually able to, to update that emissivity several times a second if necessary. And so you're always giving your temperature recording an accurate correction factor. 
So now I want to talk a little bit about what this looks like in real life and what you actually might see as you're working through a particular process. So there's a lot going on in this graph, and I'll kind of want to walk through this a little bit because I think it's kind of important. On the left side, you'll see temperature in red um, from 350 to 1250 degrees. On the right side, you see emissivity, basically on a scale from 0 to 1. And on the bottom, you have time, in this case in seconds, could be hours, could be days, but in this case, it's seconds. And you'll see two different kind of key things happening. The first is the temperature ramp, which is in that red line. And you'll see it starts at around 550. We get up to about 1,000 degree processing temperature. And then there's a cool down starting at around 200 seconds. And we cool to around 800 degrees or so. Equally important then, there is the emissivity as represented by that dark green line. And essentially, as you are starting your temperature ramp and you're heating your, your workpiece, the emissivity is essentially unchanged at just around 0 0.2. So you could say that for this part of your pyrometer measurement, it's going to be very accurate. You're going to be tracking exactly and it's behaving exactly what you would expect for the process that you have running. But something begins to happen then at around about 110 seconds, and that is as you then hit your primary processing temperature, and whatever you're trying to do to the workpiece is actually happening at that point, the annealing, for instance, let's say, then your emissivity is beginning to change, and it starts climbing from 0 0.2 to around 0 0.9. And it climbs in kind of a, a linear way, which is kind of nice, but the problem is your pyrometer doesn't know that. So your pyrometer is continuing to report emissivity, or the temperature rather, um, based on that fixed emissivity. And as represented by the blue line, you're starting to induce measurement error. And throughout that process, as long as that emissivity is changing, then you're going to start, in, you, you'll be getting a, a larger and larger error uh, over time based on that change in emissivity. You can see that as we kind of get towards the end of the process, as we get to around 200 minutes, the change in emissivity is stopped. So as we're starting the cool down on our process, then the emissivity change is gone. Emissivity is now constant. But you can also see, as indicated by that blue line in the back, your pyrometer is already wrong. So that ending emissivity that you have effectively um, on your workpiece now is different enough from the emissivity that you started with that you have kind of a permanent error. And I think in real life, you might see this because when you start a process and you get to a certain temperature range, the pyrometer works well. You then get to a certain point in the process where the pyrometer has a pretty large error. And maybe that error is repeatable, but it has a pretty large error at that point. Now, what it would be possible to do then, and this is where an active emissivity system comes in, using something, for instance, like an Onyx MCE, with active emissivity then, you're able to basically track that red line perfectly. Because as that emissivity is changing, you're actually measuring it in real time. You're able to compensate and correct in real time. And so your pyrometer is going to always be more accurate throughout that entire process. So as we get towards the conclusion here about pyrometers, I want to show you some real-world examples of the pyrometers that we've been talking about in the two different styles. So Advanced Energy makes both versions, a single channel as well as a multi-channel pyrometer. Single channel is represented on top. This is again the one where uh, everything is fully integrated, lens, detector, and filter into a single unit. And for every measurement point you have, you would have one of these pyrometers. The second style is the multi-channel system called the, uh, the Onyx MC. This is the style where you have the remote detector connected back to a fiber optic cable back to this main control unit. Uh, the multi-channel systems also employ active emissivity that we've been talking about and can be a really good solution for a lot of applications. Bringing this back together then, there are actually different ways to select the right pyrometer and different pyrometers based on their wavelength or capabilities can offer some different advantages. And I've tried to have a tried to kind of highlight on this table what that decision tree might look like. So at the top level, you need to decide whether or not you want to have a single measurement point or multiple measurement points. You need to talk a little bit about emissivity, whether you want to solve that potentially through, if there is an emissivity problem to begin with, whether or not you want to solve that through a two-color ratio system or through active emissivity. Um, is having a fiber optic cable good or bad? And then the different types of industrial productions that are available. 
And then when you look specifically at the different types of series, whether you're looking at a single channel or a multi-channel system, then there are, again, some choices. So on a single channel system, you have to decide whether or not you want to have um, a two color or a single ratio system. And then in the multi-channel, you want to make sure whether or not you want temperature or temperature with active emissivity. Lots of different choices out there based on your measurement, based on emissivity, uh, based on the temperature range you need. And this is certainly one way to kind of tackle this and kind of walk your way into the right decision. Okay, that concludes the pyrometer portion of our presentation and discussion today. I'd like to thank you for your time and attention, and now I'll hand it over to my colleague Dirk, who will begin to talk about SCR power controllers. Thanks again, and have a good day. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, okay, so now let's talk about SCR power controllers and how they work. My name is Dirk Fulbom. I'm product manager with Advanced Energy for these SCR power controllers. So first of all, the question is, what is an SCR power controller? So actually, it's a dimmer, like the dimmer in your living room to, uh, to regulate the light intensity. Yeah? But power controllers are not used for light. Normally, power controllers are used for high precision electrical heating application in the industry. So it's a crucial component uh, ensuring manufacturing quality and cost efficiency in your thermal process. On this slide, you can see the, um, the regulation loop of a, uh, of a heating system. So the power controller is, um, is the device in this yellow um, square there. So the power controller is like a valve in the electric circuit, in the, in the electric circuit that brings the heating power to the furnace. You can see the furnace on the top left. So the regulation circuit works like this. Uh, there must be a temperature measurement. So this can be a parameter or also a temperature sensor. So this temperature signal goes to a temperature controller or to a PLC. And the temperature controller or PLC creates the set point. And the set point is transferred either analog or by bus system uh, to the power controller. And the power controller keeps the power, the current or the voltage constant according to this set point. So if you ask me uh, what, is, what is so special or what is the big advantage of SCR power controllers, uh, I would normally state two things. So the first thing is that SCR power controllers are so robust. It's a really robust technology. Uh, so SCR power controllers normally don't fail. And the second really big advantage is the high efficiency. Um, it can reach up to 99.5%. So especially if you compare those to IGBT-based power supplies, 99.5% um, is really unreached and a lot better than IGBT technology. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the basics. So there are uh, two operation modes, basic operation modes in power controllers. One is full cycle firing and the other one is phase angle firing. So let us start with full cycle firing. On, on this diagram you can see a, a graph. So this is the output voltage normally or the current and uh, you can see that it is actually like a blinking. So if you connect a light bulb to the output of your power controller, you can see the light bulb blinking on, off, on, off. So there's a, cer a certain cycle time that doesn't change, and there's an on time and an off time. So according to the set point, the on time will become longer and the off time will become shorter, or with a small set point, the on time will be short and the off time will be long. Yeah. Um, there's a really big advantage of this operating mode and that's uh, that there are almost no harmonics and uh, almost no reactive power and but there's a drawback in this uh, that is that this operation mode creates flicker voltage flicker voltage means that if you have a, um, a kind of weak main supply that uh, the voltage will um, 
will, will get higher and lower a little bit in the whole main so that you can see that on light bulbs. So the second basic operating mode is phase angle firing. Uh, you can see in the graph that every half wave is cut with a certain phase angle and this phase angle depends on the set point. So if you have a very low set point, you, you only have a really small portion of this sine wave um, active. And if you have a high set point, then a big portion of the sine wave is active. So the uh, big advantage of this operating mode is that you have a high control dynamic and uh, you can uh, have an exact current limit setting. But the big disadvantage is that it creates harmonics. Now let's talk about the power factor. So for those of you who studied electrical engineering, you probably will recognize the following triangle. So it's the triangle for the relationship between apparent power, reactive power and real power and the cosine, cosine phi. So on the right hand side, you can see the respective formula, but uh, for actually it's not so easy to understand for those of you who didn't study electrical engineering. So we, uh, well, let's talk about it using a glass of beer. So if you have a glass of beer in front of you, like the one on the picture, um, actually what you want is you want the, the golden beer liquid, isn't it? So uh, the more golden beer liquid you have, the better it is, right? So if you have a half, if you have a glass only half full, but the rest is foam, then it's not so good. So it's the same with this relationship between real power and um, and reactive power. So the reactive power is like the foam on the beer; it fills the glass, but it doesn't serve. So the only thing serving for the heating power is the real power. It's like the beer liquid. So the full glass of beer is good. That's a cosine phi close to one. And uh, the half full glass of beer is bad. That's a lot, I'm a lot lower cosine phi. Okay, now um, let's talk about mains load optimization. So there are different ways of mains load optimization for the different basic operating modes. That was phase angle firing as explained before and uh, full wave switch mode. So uh, remember what I told before, phase angle firing has the advantages, advantages that uh, it is suitable for high dynamic applications, but it has the drawback that it creates harmonics and it creates reactive power. So um, there is a mains load optimization solution, which is great, and it's called voltage sequence control or VSC. Um, so uh, I will explain that. And for this full wave mode, remember um, the advantage is that you don't have any harmonics, but the disadvantage is that you create flicker voltages. And there is another main load optimization procedure called DSM, digital synchronization. Um, which reduces the flicker. So I will explain those two. Let us start with voltage sequence, sequence control. So um, for voltage sequence control, please have a look at these two circuits. On the left hand side, you can see the standard circuit with one power controller. And on the right hand side, you can see the voltage sequence control circuit uh, with two stages. So actually you have the double number of power controllers and these are connected to different tabs of the same transformer. So um, let us have a look at the next sites to, to see what it does to the waveforms. Um, so on the left hand side you can see the waveform of the normal circuit. So you can see it's really everything else than sinusoidal. It starts with nothing and then, there, then there's a big slope to the peak. And um, so now let's look at the right hand side with voltage sequence control. It's the same output voltage, but it looks a lot more sinusoidal and there's only a small voltage slope. So if you look at the harmonics at the bottom, you can see that the harmonics are significantly reduced. Uh, for example, if you look at the third and the fifth harmonic, 
it's reduced from 30 to 11 percent to only six and four percent so it's a great way of reducing harmonics without any disadvantage and keeping the face angle it's a it's an optimized face angle mode uh, optimized for harmonics um, so if you look at the power factor and remember the glass of beer so the power factor is like the parting line between the golden beer liquid and the foam. So um, imagine the glass of beer in the diagram. So if you have an output power of 100% um, or 80%, um, your glass of beer looks fine. Yeah? So for high output power, it doesn't matter if you have wanted sequence control or normal phase angle, the, uh, the uh, cosine phi is good. But if you look at output power ranges between, let's say, 40% to 80%, um, then this uh, voltage sequence control circuit is a lot better. So you, you keep your glass full and um, you, can, you, you don't need the high installation cost uh, because of uh, the reactive power. So now let's go to the DSM main slot synchronization, which is the mode to avoid flicker. If you have several power controllers and these power controllers are in full wave mode. So uh, this is an example of seven power controllers in this full wave mode. So let us look at the waveforms. So if they are not synchronized, then these on blocks will be random. So the total current is the sum of all the current blocks. So in this example, you can see the, the red line is the total current line. So there's a, a peak and a really low line. So you have, uh, you have changes, fluctuations in this total current line. So now let us apply DSM main slot synchronization. And you can see that the blocks are moved, um, optimized so that they fit together and the total current is a lot lower and smoother. So this even saves your cost regarding your installation. For example, transformer, you need a smaller transformer if, uh, if you can synchronize the power controllers and the power controllers are not used at 100% all at the same time, then you save installation cost for this. And obviously you don't create so much flicker and it's a lot smoother. So in this uh, curve, you can see the worst case on the left hand side. So all power controllers switch on at the same time. You have really high peaks and, and then almost zero. And with DSM synchronization mode, it's a, it's a smooth total current. The wiring is simple for DSM mains load optimization. You just, um, you just plug in some uh, RJ45 uh, patch cable. Okay, uh, this is a summary of the DSM mains, mains load optimization. Uh, I think I don't need to go through those, uh, but I think there's one thing to remember. It's really simple to use and it's cost effective and it saves you cost in your installation. Okay, I think uh, there are just a few things I want you to remember out of this presentation. So remember the robustness of the power controller. Remember the high accuracy and the high energy efficiency, please. Yeah, and uh, remember, please, that power controllers are a crucial component in your, in your thermal heating system. And uh, there's one thing I would like you to remind also from the presentation that Mark gave before. And that is that um, the parameters the advanced energy parameters can be combined with the advanced energy SCRs. And uh, this is a complete solution and it's fully integrated and it's a closed loop control. So please speak to our, to our guys if you want more detailed information. 
Okay, Mark and Dirk, thank you very much for those great presentations. Now, we do have some time for questions, but before we get to them, I'd like to let our audience know that if we don't get to their question, don't worry. We'll have an answer for you following the webinar. The complete Q&A transcript, including answers we do not have time for, will be sent to all of our registered attendees and will be posted with the webinar when it goes into the on-demand mode. Mark, it looks like some questions have come in for you. We'll get to those questions first, then we'll take some questions from Dirk. Okay, Mark, here's your first question. In a multi-channel system, is it possible to populate each measurement channel with different wavelengths, or do they all have to be the same wavelength? Uh, yes, and a good question. In a multi-channel system, it is actually possible to populate each of those channels with a different wavelength. Um, that would be particularly useful if there are multiple parts of a process that you're trying to monitor and maybe those different parts require different wavelengths. Another reason why you might do this is a particular wavelength may not give you the full temperature range that you need. So by choosing potentially a shorter as well as a longer wavelength, you're actually able to expand the overall temperature range of that measurement point. Okay, Mark, thanks for that answer. Here's another question for you. Using an active emissivity system, is it possible to use the system in fixed emissivity mode, or will it always measure with active emissivity? Yes, it is possible to use an active emissivity system, such as the Onyx MCE, in both fixed and active emissivity mode. Uh, so it would be possible at any point during the measurement to basically turn off or on that, that active emissivity, and the temperature will be corrected using whatever the last value was from that measurement. And thanks again for that answer, Mark. Here's another question. When using a multi-channel system with remote sensor and fiber optic cable, is it possible to replace just the sensor if it gets dirty or damaged? Yes, it is possible to basically just replace one of the sensors or the fiber optic cable for a multi-channel system. You don't have to worry about the, uh, the main system at all. You don't have to worry about replacing it or recalibrating it. Uh, it's also easy enough to take one of those small sensors out of service temporarily to clean it and then put it back in service and you never actually have to touch the main control unit. Okay, Mark, thank you for that answer. Here's another question. How frequently do pyrometers have to be recalibrated, and is this something that can be done on-site? It actually depends on the process a little bit, but we typically recommend that pyrometers be inspected, cleaned, and if necessary, recalibrated on an annual or 12-month basis. But having said that, pyrometers are relatively robust products that can deliver years of service without any recalibration necessary. Um, I would recommend that you just kind of monitor the process, and as long as that temperature is repeatable from process to process, uh, then recalibration is probably not necessary. If at some point you start to see that pyrometer drifting, or if something looks like it's no longer in spec, then at that point the pyrometer should definitely be taken out of service, checked, and recalibrated if necessary. Okay, Mark, thanks for all those great answers, and it looks like we have some questions for Dirk. So, Dirk, here we go. Here's your first question. What are typical applications for SCR power controllers? So this is a very good question. Um, actually, the uh, power controller or the SCR power controller market, it's a niche market, so you can find application in a, in a lot of different uh, industries. Yeah. So... As I said before, all applications or almost all applications are related to uh, precision electrical heating. Yeah? So every application that requires precision electrical heating probably has an SCR power controller inside yeah? or has a potential application for SCR power controllers. So normally these high precision heating applications are um, industries in which uh, one of the following is required, and that's melting, it's heating, electrical heating, it's forming, it's bending, or it's drying. Yeah? So typical industries for those kind of applications are glass and uh, yeah, glass and crystal industry, um, obviously also industrial furnaces, also for metal industry, and also oil and gas but also semiconductor and even solar. So there are a lot of different, uh, a lot of different applications. And thanks, Dirk, for that answer. Here's another question. 
In what sizes are SCR power controllers available? Okay. Um, basically, well, uh, you have to you have to distinguish between the customized solution and the standard solution. So, if you look at the power controller range from uh, Advanced Energy, our power controllers are available from eight amps up to 2,900 amps. But we have also built power controllers, customized power controllers, which have a lot of higher amperage, even 5,000 amps or something. Yeah? So the normal range is from 8 amps uh, in our product portfolio up to 2,900 amps. And obviously they are available in single phase and in three phase. And in three phase they are, uh, there's two versions. So there's this uh, two leg version the this, uh, economics three-phase circuit available. So power controllers are available single-phase, two-phase, and three-phase from 8 amps up to 2,900 amps. And we have different uh, product series, so from low end to high end. And thanks again, Dirk, for that answer. Here's another question. What temperature accuracy can be reached? So I suppose this is a um, question related to the application. Obviously, it's, it doesn't only depend on the power controller. It also depends on other components in the, in the heating, in the furnace and in the heating system. But um, the power controller is the crucial element to ensure high precision electrical heating. Yeah? So it controls the heating power that goes into the furnace. So one of the most uh, critical application for, for this kind of uh, temperature accuracy is a TFT glass. And uh, for sure, our power controllers can or are reaching uh, 0 0.2 degrees Celsius or Kelvin, 0 0.2 degree accuracy in temperature control in TFT glass. Okay, Dirk, thanks for that last answer, and it seems as though we're about out of time, so we're going to have to wrap up this webinar right there. Mark Ritzheimer and Dirk Fulboom, thanks for sharing your expertise and time with all of us today. And a special thank you to all of our audience members for being part of this webinar event. Again, thanks for taking the time to join us for this webinar event. Take care and have yourselves a great rest of your day.